Hello and welcome. Let's talk uh, chapter 17. Chapter 17 takes us into our special senses. So let's go through and let's discuss our special senses. Now when we discuss our special senses, the first special sense that we want to go through and we want to discuss is going to be uh, our sense of vision. We will see the sense of vision and how it fully works in uh, physiology. Here in anatomy, what we'll do is we'll lay down all of the anatomical components and then this way when you get to physiology you know exactly what you have there and you can just start putting all of these uh, uh, actors in the show uh, to their roles and start seeing exactly how then the sense is uh, going to work. So let's start here with uh, vision. Let me get this expanded. All right. Come on. All right. All right, so here we go. So first here when we talk uh, vision, so we're going to be talking about the eye is basically what we're going to be looking at. Now what we'll do first is we'll go through all of the accessory structures of the eye. Again, if you're following along with my note taker, this makes life much easier for you as well. So here we'll talk first the accessory structures of the eye. Now when we talk about the accessory structure of the eye, the first accessory structure in relation to the eyes that we want to go through and we want to mention is going to be the eyebrows. Here we can appreciate the eyebrows. The eyebrows you can see are basically very short or most of the time short uh, coarse hairs. Short coarse hairs. And then they can get to longer and longer and obviously uh, providing us with more protection is what we'll uh, interpret that as then. Okay, uh, so uh, very short, coarse hairs. Now, where are they located? So the location of the eye uh, brows is going to be, they are found overlying the supraorbital margin. If you recall, we were able to discuss supraorbital margin in the class and um, before all of this happened. And um, the supraorbital margin was one part we were talking about in relation to one of these uh, bones here, the frontal bone. So here you can see that supraorbital margin is going to be found, we discussed it as being uh, at the superior end of this orbital, uh, uh, basically this orbital cavity. So here now we have the eyelashes, I'm sorry, the eyebrows, these eyebrows now are found overlying the supraorbital margin. So the supraorbital margin is what we have underneath here. So when you're touching the eyebrows, in uh, underneath this region here, you have all of that supraorbital margin. So found overlying the supraorbital margin is going to be the eyebrows. Now when we go through and we talk eyebrows, their function. First, when we talk fu function in relation to the eyebrows, their number one function is that they're going to help shade the eyes. They will help shade the eyes. They'll shade the eyes from sunlight. That's number one. Number two, I'd like you to know that they prevent perspiration. They will prevent perspiration from trickling down the forehead. They prevent perspiration from trickling down the forehead and reaching the eyes. And then you can see athletes. Athletes will do um, uh, put basically even further protection where they're going to uh, wear like uh, headbands or forehead bands, I, I believe you call them, uh, and. Um, they're going to provide even further protection from that perspiration and keep it from trickling down into the eyes. Next, then let's talk eyelashes. Uh, I'm sorry, eyelids, and then we'll get into the eyelashes. So eyelids, I'm just excited about eyelashes, I guess. Um, eyelids, now when we talk eyelids, eyelids are also going to be known as your palpebrae. So anatomically speaking, your palpebrae. Now when we talk palpebrae, they are mobile, they are thin, they are skin-covered folds. So they are mobile, they are thin, they are skin-covered folds. So again, you can see right inside of here, each of your eyelids, your palpebrae. Now when we talk uh, eyelid uh, function, where are they found located? They're found located anteriorly on the face or on the skull. Located anteriorly on the face or the skull. Just inferior to, we can say, right, inferior to the eyebrows. Inferior to the eyebrows. And what is their function? When we look at their function, their function is to protect the eyes. Their function is to protect the actual eye. To protect the eye. 
Now, some structures in relation to the eyelids. Now, when we talk about some structures, first structure we have here is the palpebral fissure. The palpebral fissure. Now, when we talk palpebral fissure, it's uh, you can think of a scientific way of saying your eyelid slit. Your eyelid slit. It's basically the space you have in between the superior and inferior eyelids. So the palpebral fissure is your eyelid slit or the space you have in between the superior and the inferior eyelids. And this palpebral fissure is basically separating the eyelids. Separating the eyelids. So here you can see with the eye open, it's a more pronounced palpebral fissure versus the eyes closed. Right, that palpebral fissure size is basically changing. <clears throat> Next we have the lateral and the medial commissures. Now when we talk about the lateral and the medial commissures, they're basically the angles. They are the angles of the eyes. So lateral commissure, and here you got the medial commissure. So angles of the eye, medial and lateral. Next is the lacrimal caruncle. Now when we talk lacrimal caruncle, the lacrimal caruncle is found at the medial commissure. So it's found at the medial commissure. And the lacrimal caruncle is a bit of flesh. It is a bit of flesh. And it contains, you'll see, sebaceous and sweat glands. It will contain sebaceous and sweat glands. So the lacrimal caruncle. And these sebaceous and sweat glands, they are going to produce the whitish, oily secretions. They produce the whitish and oily secretions that are going to collect during sleep. That will collect during sleep. Next, we have the orbicularis oculi. We have the orbicularis oculi, and we talk about the orbicularis oculi. The orbicularis oculi, we talked uh, eye muscles, and we went into that eye muscle, and we've discussed that before. Um, so, number one, orbicularis oculi is going to be found within the eyelid. So, we're discussing it here. It's found within the eyelid. And if you remember its action, it's going to help close the eye when the muscle contracts. So, it's, in, so it's encircling the eye. In order to appreciate it, what we could do is we can move over... And we can move over to this slide right inside of here. And you can appreciate that orbicularis oculi right outside of there. And again, you should have that idea from uh, the previous exam that we just took, uh, exam three, where we discussed the orbicularis oculi and how you found it encircling the eye. And then when it contracted, its action was to protect the eye, close the eye. Next, then we have the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. Now, levator palpebrae superioris, you can appreciate. If you listen to the name, it's giving you all the information you're going to need to know right inside of there. Levator, action, palpebrae, and superioris. So, action and location, you've got all inside of there. Next, then we have our tarsal plate. The tarsal plate is basically connective tissue sheets. So, you can see that in the superior eyelid. And you get the same thing in the inferior eyelid as well. There are connective tissue sheets that are going to support the eyelids. That will support the eyelids. And also what they do is they help anchor the two muscles that we've just mentioned there, you can see. Providing support and anchoring the orbicularis oculi. And then also here, you see on the inferior. And then the superior, you can see the levator palpebrae superioris coming in there as well. Next, then you have your tarsal glands. When we talk about the glands, the tarsal glands, they're going to be embedded in the tarsal plates. They're embedded in the tarsal plates, and they're ducts, and they're ducts, D-U-C-T-S. Their ducts are going to open at the eyelid edge. Their ducts will open at the eyelid edge just posterior to the eyelashes. Posterior to the eyelashes. So you can see those openings are right 
along this edge here, and the same thing right along this edge right inside of here. So that's the glands inside we described, and then their ducts opening right at that surface. Now they're going to produce an oily secretion. These glands produce an oily secretion, and this oily secretion is going to help to lubricate the eyelids. It helps to lubricate the eyelids and keeps those eyes, those eyelids from sticking together. And it will keep those eyelids from sticking together. Next thing we have our eyelashes. Our eyelashes, the much anticipated uh, structure here. Eyelashes, they're going to project from the free margin of each eyelid. You can see that. They're projecting from the free margin of each eyelid. And these eyelashes are richly innervated. They're richly innervated by nerve endings. They are richly innervated by nerve endings. So anything that touches them, anything that touches those eyelashes, it triggers the blinking reflex. It will trigger the blinking reflex. Next here on this image, we can appreciate the conjunctiva. Now when we discuss conjunctiva, the conjunctiva is going to be a transparent mucous membrane. It is a transparent mucous membrane. The conjunctiva is going to be found located surrounding the cornea. It is found surrounding the cornea and you can say covering or lining the eyelids. So surrounding the cornea and covering or lining the eyelids. The function, we talk about the function of the conjunctiva, the function of the conjunctiva is to produce a lubricating mucus. Its function is to produce a lubricating mucus that's going to prevent, that will keep the eyes from drying out. That will prevent the eyes from drying out. There are some structures here in relation to the conjunctiva itself as well. So a few divisions, we can say, of the conjunctiva. Now, first we have what we call the palpebral conjunctiva. Again, if you listen to the words, just those words alone are telling you exactly where you need to go. So palpebrae we already discussed, and now conjunctiva in relation to the palpebrae. Here you can see the superior, and here you've got inferior. And then here we can appreciate the bulbar conjunctiva. The bulbar conjunctiva is a segment surrounding that cornea. Segment surrounding the cornea. Now between the two, between the two, you've got the conjunctival sac. The conjunctival sac. This conjunctival sac now is a slit-like space. It is a slit-like space, and it's going to be found between the two conjunctiva. And this is the space where your contact lenses will be found lying, right? Because the contact lenses will be overlying the cornea, and they're usually a little bit bigger than the cornea, and they'll go around overlying that bulbar conjunctiva, and sometimes slightly, and then basically resting in the space in between the two. And sometimes they get lost in this conjunctival sac as well. And then you got to go in there and pull them out, a pain of contact lenses. Next in here we've got, um, so conjunctival sac there as well. Now let's talk then the lacrimal apparatus. The lacrimal apparatus, oh, I'm sorry, before we jump back, conjunctivitis, you should uh, 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 probably have heard of or be familiar with. Now conjunctivitis is inflammation. Again, if you listen to the words, itis, we've talked about being inflammation now of conjunctiva. So conjunctivitis. Now we talk conjunctivitis, inflammation of the conjunctiva. Inflammation of the conjunctiva leaves that conjunctiva usually being red, irritated, and producing secretions, uh, uh, not just the conjunctiva, but then also you'll see you have secretions being produced by the other components there as well, trying to kind of uh, wash out whatever it is there and trying to get rid of whatever it is there. And um, most of the time, uh, uh, conjunctivitis is diagnosed as being viral and uh, in cause, uh, and really nothing that you could do there, avoid uh, social distancing, and uh, kind of like what we're doing now, 
and um, uh, you know basically keep it clean uh, and don't irritate it even further bacterials where you can bring in some antibiotics uh, uh, you know and so forth but um, so conjunctivitis inflammation of the conjunctiva is what I'd like you to know and when you get to farm and uh, you get to other classes uh, micro even they might uh, discuss these uh, uh, causative agents and uh, the treatments there for the conditions as well so conjunctivitis Next in here, let's move down. Let's talk about the lacrimal apparatus then. So let's move images. Let's go to this, even from this image, this image here. Let's talk lacrimal apparatus. And we talk lacrimal apparatus. The so lacrimal apparatus, it's going to consist of a few parts. So we'll go through all the different parts and then we'll see what it's going to do as well. Now it's going to consist of, you can see a gland and the gland is going to secrete into some ducts and the ducts will take these secretions into the eye you can see and then from the eye they're going to make their way into um, other uh, basically openings and eventually into uh, a drainage system that helps to take eventually those secretions, those tears into you can see the nasal cavity into the nasal cavity so now you should be able to understand uh, uh, why when you cry you also have a runny nose uh, there as well these secretions are being hypersecreted and then you've got this uh, uh, increased drainage occurring there as well. So the location, let's talk location of this lacrimal apparatus. Uh, right? The lacrimal apparatus you can see is going to be found surrounding the eye. It is found surrounding the eye and in the nasal cavity. Surrounding the eye and in the nasal cavity. Function. Function is to secrete secretions, that's what the gland is there for. And then the rest of the components are going to help to drain tears. So secrete secretions and then drain tears. So let's talk about some structures first. Some structures we have, first structure is the lacrimal gland. The lacrimal gland, you can appreciate here on the lateral aspect, the lacrimal gland is located above the orbit. Located above the orbit at the lateral end above the orbit as we described at the lateral end and this lacrimal gland is going to release dilute it's going to release a dilute saline solution it releases a dilute saline solution what we refer to as tears now we've got the excretory ducts of the lacrimal glands you can see the excretory ducts of the lacrimal glands are going to help to drain those secretions and remember we we're talking ducts so here you should be able to understand what type of glands we're talking about, right? Very good. I know you got that answer. We're talking excretory ducts. So ducts, exocrine glands. Right? Endocrine glands are ductless, we talked. So here then you can appreciate the lacrimal puncta. So the excretory ducts are going to drain those secretions from the gland and into the eye. Now here we can appreciate the lacrimal puncta. The lacrimal puncta are going to be these two tiny openings. They look like little red dots. They're two tiny openings. They look like little red dots. And they're visible. They are visible on the medial margin of each eyelid. They are visible on the medial margin of each eyelid. You can appreciate the inferior lacrimal puncta right inside of here. And here right on top we've got the superior lacrimal puncta right on top. These puncta, so a pair, they're going to lead us to the lacrimal canaliculi. Lacrimal canaliculi. The lacrimal canaliculi also is a pair, superior and inferior. And the lacrimal canaliculi will drain those tears from the puncta. So the puncta will take these secretions from the eye and introduce them then to the next component, which is the lacrimal canaliculi. Now the lacrimal canaliculi will take these secretions and it will guide these secretions to the lacrimal sac to the lacrimal sac. So here you can appreciate now the lacrimal sac. The lacrimal sac then will drain these tears into, you can see, the nasal lacrimal duct. Into the nasal lacrimal duct. So the lacrimal sac carries tears from the canaliculi to the duct. And the la nasal lacrimal duct will then carry these tears from the lacrimal sac into the nasal cavity. Now, when we talk nasal cavity, you can see more specifically speaking where in the nasal cavity we're at. Inferior nasal concha, 
And then here we had the meatus. And you can see that opening of that nasolacrimal duct right at that dorsal aspect of that inferior nasal concha or into the inferior nasal meatus, you could say. Let's discuss then your extrinsic eye muscles. We've talked about them before. Let's look at them then in greater detail. So this is one view here, another view here, right? Lateral view, superior view, and then you can see all three views together. And then here you got that uh, lateral view there by itself as well. Let's just go here. So here when we talk uh, extrinsic eye muscles, first uh, structure you can appreciate here is going to be the annular ring. The annular ring, the annular ring is also known as a common tendinous ring. It's found at the back of the orbit. You can see it right inside of there. Back of the orbit, right behind here. This common tendinous ring is going to be important because we'll see it's found at the back of the orbit and it's the origin site. It's the origin site of the four rectus muscles. It is the origin site of the four rectus muscles. These muscles... These muscles are the most precisely and rapidly controlled skeletal muscles in the entire body. These muscles are going to be the most rapidly controlled and precisely controlled skeletal muscles in the body. Right During exam days, mine are uh, working uh, up to par. They're perfect. They're... Uh, I joke with you guys and tell you my eyes are faster than a, a convenience store surveillance camera, uh, you know, just to make sure everybody has got the same exact uh, opportunity. And nobody needs uh, any uh, extra opportunity to be able to cheat or anything there. So um, here we can see, again, they're going to be the most uh, precisely and rapidly controlled skeletal muscles in the body. So let's talk then uh, the four rectus muscles first, and then we'll get into the obliques. So first here we've got uh, the superior rectus muscle. The superior rectus muscle you can appreciate here from this frontal view very nicely, right inside of here. From this superior view you can see here very nicely. And then from this lateral view you can appreciate right here on top. And we talk superior rectus muscle. Superior rectus muscle, it elevates the eye when you talk about its action. Right? You thought you were done with MAOI. Well, here it goes again. Uh, it's going to be responsible for elevating the eyes and turning it medially. So it elevates the eye and turns the eye medially. Next, then we have the inferior rectus. Inferior rectus, you can appreciate from the frontal view, right inside of here. Lateral view, right inside of here. Superior view. It's tough to see underneath there because of the superior blocking it. When we talk inferior rectus, inferior rectus depresses the eye and turns it medially. It depresses the eye and turns it medially. Medial rectus. Medial rectus is going to move the eye medially. Medially. Here we can appreciate the medial rectus. Back here. And then right on this side here, medial rectus. So moves the eye medially. Lateral rectus moves the eye laterally. Lateral rectus, you can appreciate here on the lateral aspect. It's been cut here. And here you can appreciate on the opposite side of the medial. And then the last two are going to be the obliques. When we talk obliques, we've got first superior oblique muscle. The superior oblique, you can see here, Coming in at an oblique fashion, like the name says. Superior oblique. Now, superior oblique, it depresses the eye. Its action is to depress the eye and turns it laterally. So it depresses the eye and it turns it laterally. In relation to superior oblique muscle, you can also appreciate this trochlea. Right inside this little corner, the trochlea. Right up in there, the trochlea. Right up in here, trochlea. Trochlea is a fibrocartilaginous loop. It's a fibrocartilaginous loop that's responsible for providing support to the superior oblique muscle. So it's a pulley you can kind of think of. 
or a fibral cartilaginous loop. And it's suspended from the frontal bone, suspended from the frontal bone, provides support to the superior oblique muscle as we've described. Next then we have our inferior oblique. The inferior oblique you can appreciate from this lateral view and then also from this anterior view, the frontal view. This inferior oblique now is going to be responsible for elevating the eye and turning it laterally. It elevates the eye and turns it laterally. Elevates the eye and turns it laterally. Next thing you can see is your cranial nerves. You need to go through and you've got to know every single one of those cranial nerves. We've gone through them. We've already talked about them. We've discussed them in the last class as well. Here you have a little mnemonic. A little mnemonic, a good way to remember that. You can think of here this chemical formula. We're uh, big fans of chemistry, right? So one way to remember is we'll apply chemistry here. LR6, we'll write our chemical formula for everything involved here. Right? It's a, this is um, like chemistry, so we like everything balanced. We want to make sure we know what is happening where and how many of what we have. So here we can see quick, easy way to remember them. Lateral rectus, six nerve. Superior oblique. Cranial nerve number four, correct? And then the rest of them, all cranial nerve number three. All cranial nerve three. Lateral rectus, superior oblique, and the rest of them. Saves you study time if you use it to your advantage. Let's move next and let's talk uh, more about the eye. Let's talk about the eye. We talk about the eye, so we've taken care of all of that. Let's go through here. It's a nice image depicting the eye. I like this image here a little bit better. It's a bit more uh, descriptive. So here when we look at the eye, the eye is shaped as a sphere. It's got uh, about a two and a half centimeter diameter, a one inch diameter you can think of. Now when you look at the eye, you can see only the anterior one sixth only the anterior one-sixth of the eye's surface is visible. The rest is enclosed and protected. The rest is enclosed and protected. Now the protection. The protection you've seen comes from, first you had bone, right? Uh, that bone, uh, all those different bones help to form that orbital cavity, right? So you've got to be responsible for knowing all those different bones in there we've discussed before. And then you've got inside of there adipose fat. Let's actually move back to this picture right inside of here. You can actually appreciate the hollow chamber, that cavity. And then you can see how it's going to be occupied by adipose. So we talk fat. Fat occupies all of the orbit that's not occupied by the eye. When I've uh, dissected the eye out, it's not something that just comes out easy. It's, it's real tough. And when we do our dissection, in the class you would actually be doing a sheep dissection, sheep eye dissection. What happens is we do our cut right up in here. So the eye is closed and uh, we'll make a cut right above the eyelid and make our way in right here on top, trying to keep the whole eye preserved. And then basically you've got fingers, you've got to stick our fingers in there and uh, uh, without causing damage to the eye, we've got to get that eye out of there and uh, basically be cutting all this connective tissue and separating that eye from all that connective tissue. So the orbit you've got, fat you've got, there as well. Now here you can see the eye. So it looks shape of a sphere. Okay, same thing here as you see here. So here you can see we've got two poles here. South pole and north pole, right? Santa Claus is living at one. No, here we've got an anterior pole. We've got a posterior pole, right? Just like our biosphere, we've got a south pole and a north pole. Those are going to be the most southern and the most northern points of the sphere. Well, here we have the most anterior and most posterior points. Now let's go through and let's discuss the layers of the eye. And we talk about the layers. The eye is going to get divided up into three major layers. Into three major layers that we're going to go through we're going to check out. So the first layer we can see here is going to be the fibrous layer. 
Now the fibrous layer we can appreciate right outside of here. The fibrous layer is the outermost layer. It is the outermost layer. This fibrous layer is dense avascular connective tissue. And it gets divided up into two regions. It gets divided up into two regions. You can see here you have first what we call the sclera. Here what we have first, the sclera, making its way all the way around. Second, we have, we're going to see the cornea. Let's talk first sclera. So again, I told you, this first layer, the fibrous layer, has two regions to it. The sclera we'll discuss first. The sclera, you can see it forms the posterior portion. It forms the posterior portion and the bulk. Okay, or you can say the majority. You can see that here. It forms the posterior portion or the bulk or the majority, we said, of this fibrous layer. It is tough, it's tendon-like, and it protects and shapes the eyeball. Protects and shapes the eyeball. And also, it's going to provide a sturdy anchoring site. It provides a sturdy anchoring site for those extrinsic eye muscles we've just gone through and discussed. Now, when we talk about the sclera, the sclera, you'll see it is continuous with dura matter, and it is pierced by, you can see here, the optic nerve. It's pierced posteriorly by the optic nerve. The optic nerve penetrates through and makes its way through it. Next, then we have the cornea. Then we talk cornea. Cornea is avascular, as we described. The end, it forms the anterior sixth of the fibrous layer. So it's very small. It forms the anterior sixth of the fibrous layer. Two birds are fighting, a crow, a raven, and a smaller bird. <laughs> Pretty interesting. So next in here we've got it forming, again, the anterior one-sixth. Okay, that's all it forms. You can see the rest of it is all sclera. So here we can see now when we talk about the cornea, the cornea, it bulges. It's, it's transparent. Okay, it's transparent. And you can see from its junction with the sclera, it bulges anteriorly. So from that junction with the sclera, you see it bulges anteriorly. It's transparent as I described. So the crystal clear cornea, I want you to know, forms a window. The crystal clear cornea forms a window that will let light enter the eye. Next, then we have the second layer. The second layer is called the vascular layer. Now, when we talk about the vascular layer, the vascular layer, it forms the middle coat of the eyeball. So it forms, so it's the second layer we're going to discuss. It's here in red. It forms the middle coat of the eyeball. You see why I say that? This vascular layer is also called the uvea, also known as the uvea, and it's going to be divided up into three regions, uvea. First region, choroid. The choroid, we can appreciate right back inside of here. The choroid, I'd like you to know, is blood vessel rich. The choroid, so hence the name vascular layer, right? Now, choroid is blood vessel rich. It's got a dark brown membrane you can see to its structure. It's got a dark brown membrane to its structure. And the choroid forms 
It forms the posterior five sixths you can think of of the vascular layer. You can say it forms the majority of the vascular layer even. The second division here I want you to know about, the second region we can say here, is going to be now the ciliary body. The ciliary body is the choroid anteriorly. So again, here we've got the choroid making its way all the way around. Here what they did is they cut it, just so you can appreciate what it looks like underneath there as well. So here it makes its way around, and you can see that there's three different layers. So it makes its way all around underneath here coming around, and you can see that it becomes the ciliary body. When we talk about the ciliary body, the ciliary body is the choroid anteriorly, as I've described. It's a thickened ring of tissue. It is a thickened ring of tissue that encircles the lens. It's a thickened ring of tissue that encircles the lens. Now, the ciliary body, the ciliary body, is made up of a couple of different parts. The first part here I'd like you to know about is the ciliary processes. Here we have ciliary processes, and these processes are basically interlacing smooth muscle bundles. They are interlacing smooth muscle bundles, the ciliary muscles they're also known as. And the ciliary processes are going to be important in controlling the shape of the lens. They're important in controlling the shape of the lens. The shape of the lens is going to be controlled when we talk about physiology, vision processing. You'll see the eye is going to have to make adaptations when we want to look at something close. And one of those is going to be the shape of the lens changing. And then when we, versus when we look at something far away, it'll be a different shape compared to what it was when we were looking at objects that are close. So the shape change is going to be important. Next in here we have our ciliary zonules. Now the ciliary zonules are also known as the suspensory ligaments. And they're going to be found extending from the ciliary processes to the lens. They extend from the ciliary processes to the lens. They encircle you can see and help hold the lens in its upright position in the eye. So the ciliary zonules, so or your suspensory ligaments, we've described them as as well, they are going to be extending from the ciliary processes to the lens. They will extend to the lens from those processes. These zonules encircle and help hold the lens in its upright position in the eye. So you can see those onules there very nicely. Your suspensory ligaments. And they're going to be involved with changing the shape. Next one we have the iris. The iris. Now the iris is going to be the anterior continu continuation of that ciliary body, you can see. So right inside of here, now we've got the iris. This is one view of the iris. We can see the iris from here as well. Right inside of here. It's a visible colored part of the eye underneath the cornea. So the cornea is a transparent part, we said. Underneath there now is what you're seeing. So coming back to this picture, you can see the cornea is right out there. And underneath there, is the iris. So when we talk about the iris, iris is the visible colored part of the eye. It's the visible colored part of the eye. This is what you look at and you determine somebody's eye color. You say, oh, your eyes are green, your eyes are blue, or your eyes are brown, because you're looking at that iris. So the iris is the visible colored part of the eye. It's the most anterior portion, or it's at the most anterior position of the vascular layer you can think of. It's found at the most anterior position of the vascular layer. It lies between the cornea and the lens. So you can see there it's found lying between the cornea and the lens. Here you've got the cornea anterior to it and the lens then dorsal to it. It's continuous with the ciliary body, as we can see there. It's continuous with the ciliary body. 
And it itself has two pupillae. It itself has two pupillae. To be able to appreciate those pupillae, we'll move over to this picture right in here to appreciate them. But before we do that, let's come back here and let's talk about the pupil. Now, when we talk about the pupil, the pupil is a round central opening. It's a round central opening of the iris. It's a round central opening of the iris. Now, this pupil, it regulates the passage of light into the eye. It will regulate the passage of light into the eye. It regulates the passage by constricting or dilating that, uh, basically, that pupil, that iris. So how does that happen? That happens thanks to the two sets of muscles you have here, the sphincter pupillae and the dilator pupillae. And here you can see when each of them get activated, this also happens to mimic either a sympathetic or parasympathetic response that we've already gone through and we've discussed. So here we can see first we've got our sphincter pupillae. Now when we discuss our sphincter pupillae, our sphincter pupillae or the circular muscles, they're also known as, are going to be pupillae that are going to function in close vision and bright light. So in close vision, when you're looking at something really close, or in bright light, the sphincter pupillae will contract. And when the sphincter pupillae contract, this causes the pupils to constrict, decreasing the quantity of light being allowed into the eye. So again, in close vision, and also in bright light. For example, when you wake up in the morning. So here you can appreciate those sphincter pupillae activating. And when they activate, again, they're going to cause constriction. Muscle contraction is going to cause a constriction of that pupil size. It's what is also a parasympathetic response, as we've described before. Now, opposite, we can see with the other set of muscles, the dilator pupillae or the radial muscles. Now, in distant vision, in distant vision and dim light, so distant vision and dim light is going to get the dilator pupillae to contract. So, in distant vision and dim light, the dilator pupillae contract and the pupil dilates, and the pupil dilates, and when the pupil dilates, what is this going to do? It's going to allow more light to make its way into the eye. So that's why in distant vision, when you're trying to look at something far away, we want to be able to see. So in distant vision, the dilator pupillae will cause the pupil to dilate, allowing more light to enter into the eye allowing us to see what we're trying to see then. Next, then we move to the third layer. The third layer now we can appreciate here is going to be the inner layer or the innermost layer of the eyeball. And this inner layer is a very delicate two-layered retina. It's a very delicate two-layered retina. When we talk about this retina, first we have what we call the pigmented layer, the pigmented layer. The pigmented layer is the outer layer of the two. It's the outer layer of the two. It's basically a single thick lining, a single cell, thick lining, a single cell, thick lining. So it's just a single cell thick. That's it. And this pigmented layer, it abuts the choroid. It's found lying right next to the choroid. So from here, we can't appreciate the two layers. So what we'll do is we'll zoom in on this retina. When we zoom in on the retina, here now you can appreciate those two layers now. So here, let me orient you. You've got that pigmented layer right inside of here. I told you it's abutting the choroid, which you see right inside of there. And here's the rest of then the retina. Let's zoom in on this even further. Here is your pigmented layer. I said it's a single cell thick lining. Single cell thick, that's it. And here's the rest of it, the rest of the retina. So this is the pigmented layer of the retina. 
And the rest of it is going to be called the neural layer of the retina. The neural layer of the retina. Why neural? I mean, just look at the picture. It tells you everything. Photoreceptors. You can see bipolar cells. And we've got ganglion cells. Now, when we talk about the pigmented layer, so it's the outer single cell thick lining, it abuts the choroid, and it's going to extend anteriorly to cover the ciliary body and the posterior face of the iris. It extends anteriorly to cover the ciliary body and the posterior face of the iris. It's got a few jobs. Number one, it's to contain vitamin A. It contains vitamin A. And vitamin A is going to be required you'll see by the photopigment, which is within the photoreceptor, which is embedded within the pigmented layer. Right? So when parents told you to eat your carrots, they weren't lying. They knew that vitamin A inside those carrots is going to get absorbed and placed inside of that pigmented layer. Second job is that they're going to absorb light. The pigmented cells there are going to absorb light and prevent it from scattering. Choroid does that as well, and they'll do the same thing. They're going to prevent this light from scattering and help to process that image we're trying to see. Next, then you have the neural layer. So let's go back into here. You can see the neural layer. Now we talk neural layer. The neural layer is the transparent inner layer. It's the transparent inner layer, and it extends anteriorly it extends anteriorly to cover. So it extends anteriorly to the posterior margin of the ciliary body. It extends anteriorly to cover the posterior margin of the ciliary body. Also appreciated here is the aura serrata. When we talk about the aura serrata, the aura serrata is going to be a saw-toothed margin. It is a saw-toothed margin. And this is where the neural layer blends into the ciliary body. This is where the neural layer blends into the ciliary body. So moving back then, we can appreciate the photoreceptors. Again, if you have this uh, note taker, my students, uh, uh, you know, for my class at least, uh, you guys get the note takers, you guys know how to use the website. It's not that uh, uncommon. I know people from other classes that tell me they use it as well. Uh, so here, photoreceptors, so you see we went from the aura serrata. Again, this is all in relation to that neural layer. So now the photoreceptors. So when we talk photoreceptors, now photoreceptors, are found abutting the pigmented layer. So they abut the pigmented layer. And they're going to help spread signals in response to light. They will help spread signals in response to light. So again, we are on the retina. And you can appreciate now that retina in its entirety. You see why we mentioned the aura serrata there? And then we went deep into, <coughs> excuse me, the photoreceptors. So again, on the note taker, it follows all in sequence. Now these photoreceptors, photoreceptors, they're going to help spread signals in response to light. You have two types. You have rods and you have cones. When we talk rods, you can see just right off the bat, rods are going to be more numerous in quantity. They're found to be more numerous in quantity. The rods are dim light and peripheral vision receptors. They are dim light and peripheral vision receptors. And our rods, they allow us to see tones of gray. They allow us to perceive tones of gray, gray colors. Next, we have our cones. Cones, they operate in bright light. So they are our bright light receptors. And they provide us with high acuity color vision. 
They provide us with high acuity color vision. They will allow us to see colors such as blue, green, red, plus a hue of these colors when they're mixed. So our color receptors versus our gray color receptors, gray tone receptors, you can say. Now, color receptors we have, I told you blue, green, and red. So when you talk color blindness, which affects males, right, because of the genetic pattern of inheritance. So here, these individuals now will be lacking one of those pigments. Okay, they'll be lacking either blue pigment or green pigment and red pigment, this will then allow them to see those various colors. Next in the pathway are your bipolar cells. We've discussed these types of neurons. We said that they're found uh, very rare in the body, and this is one of the other places that you're going to find them. These bipolar cells, now what they do is they receive signals from those photoreceptors, and they will then pass along these signals to the ganglion cells. So they're kind of like the middle cells you can think of. So they receive signals, they're stimulated from the photoreceptors, and then they in turn stimulate or send these signals to the ganglion cells. Ganglion cells are the cells where the actual action potential is going to be generated. Right? Because we've talked about where the action potential is going to be generated, it's in the dendrite. I'm sorry, it's uh, going to be in the axon. So here you can see the dendrites for each of these neurons. Here you've got their cell bodies. And then here you can see their axons. There's no action potential generated in these receptor cells, nor in these cells here. So action potentials will be generated in the axons of your ganglion cells. These cells, they come together. They're found lying close together. You can see their axons make these right angle turns or 90 degree turns. And those axons all come together to form the optic nerve. As we've described before, a nerve is a collection of axons. Here, moving back, you can appreciate that optic nerve here as well. Here's all those ganglion cells from the top row. Look at these cells are also, their axons making these 90 degree or right angle turns helping to make this optic nerve part up here and then this optic nerve part down here and you've got the whole nerve in its entirety. Next in here we can appreciate the horizontal cells and the amacrine cells. Here we've got horizontal cells and we've got some amacrine cells. These horizontal cells and amacrine cells are other types of neurons and what they're going to do is they're going to play a role in visual processing. They will play a role in visual processing. The other three we mentioned there, top three you've got to know about. Or four, because rods and cones. Optic nerve. So you should be able to tell me then what cells make it up, or even more specifically, what part of the cell. Now in relation to that optic nerve, we've got the optic disc. So going back to this picture, you can see the optic disc. This is one way we will see it. The optic disc is the blind spot. It's the blind spot because it lacks, because it lacks photoreceptors. This is where the optic nerve exits the eye. This is where the optic nerve exits the eye. And this is found as a weak spot. This is found as a weak spot in the fundus basically in the posterior wall, you can see of the eye. So here, if we were to look at the eye now with an ophthalmoscope, right, making your way into your partner's pupil and looking right in, you would see this image. So here you can actually appreciate the optic disc. This is the blind spot. Again, why is it the blind spot? Very good. No photoreceptors exist here. Very good. Next then, looking lateral to the optic disc, you can appreciate the macula lutea. 
the macula lutea, it's an oval region lateral to the blind spot of each eye. An oval region lateral to an oval region lateral to the optic disc of each eye. Next thing we have our fovea centralis. The fovea centralis is a minute pit. It's a minute pit in the center of the macula lutea. It's a minute pit in the center of the macula lutea. The fovea centralis is going to contain a high concentration of cones. It contains a high concentration of cones. And this high concentration of cones is going to provide us with high acuity color vision. It will provide us with high acuity color vision. Next thing here, we can appreciate the central artery and the central vein. The central artery and the central vein are going to service, so they serve the inner two thirds of the neural retina. They service the inner two-thirds of the neural retina, and they're found entering and exiting that eye right through the optic nerve. And you can see them there as well. So here is another view of an ophthalmoscope. being used to look at the inside of the eye. Next, you can appreciate here how the lens and the ciliary zonule are going to be responsible for dividing the eye. I want you to know the lens and the ciliary zonules are going to help divide the eye. They're going to help divide the eye into two segments. They will help divide the eye into two segments. Now here, when we go through and we look at them dividing the eyes into two segments, here you've got first the posterior segment. The posterior segment is going to be found posterior to the lens and those uh, ciliary uh, zonules. Now this posterior segment is going to be filled with a clear gel. Going to be filled with a clear gel. And this clear gel is a, it's a clear gel, it's vitreous humor is its name. Vitreous humor. Let's discuss more of this vitreous humor. This vitreous humor, I would like you to know, is going to be formed. It will be formed in the embryo. So it gets formed in the embryo and it lasts for a lifetime. And it will last for a lifetime. This vitreous humor has a few functions. You can see it here. They've cut it a little bit here. And then you can see the bottom part of it right inside of here. This vitreous humor, number one, it's going to be responsible for transmitting light. It transmits light. Number two, it supports the lens. Supports the lens. And it helps hold the neural retina against the pigmented layer. So it supports the lens and supports the retina by keeping the neural layer against the pigmented layer. And it's going to contribute to intraocular pressure. And it contributes to intraocular pressure. It helps to counteract the pulling force of the extrinsic eye muscles. It's helping to counteract the pulling force of the extrinsic eye muscles. Next then, anterior to the lens and the ciliary zonules, we've got the anterior segment. Now when we talk anterior segment, the anterior segment is subdivided by the iris now. It gets subdivided by the iris. It'll get subdivided by the iris into a posterior chamber 
and an anterior chamber. So when we talk posterior chamber, posterior chamber is found between the iris and the lens. Found between the iris and the lens. And then we've got the anterior chamber. The anterior chamber is found between the cornea and the iris. Found between the cornea and the iris. Next then we have our aqueous humor. When we talk aqueous humor, aqueous humor is going to fill the entire anterior segment. It will fill the entire anterior segment. Now, when we talk aqueous humor, aqueous humor, so it fills the entire anterior segment. The aqueous humor is a clear fluid. It is a clear fluid. It is similar in composition to blood plasma. It's a clear fluid, similar in composition to blood plasma. Let's zoom in on this anterior chamber and the anterior segment and posterior segment here now and posterior chamber in greater detail we can see so posterior segment anterior segment anterior segment gets further subdivided into a anterior chamber and posterior chamber here you can appreciate now also the scleral venous sinus the scleral venous sinus, number one, it's found. You can see at the junction of, you can see the sclera and the cornea. It's also known as the canal of Schlem. Also known as the canal of Schlem. It's an unusual venous channel. It's an unusual venous channel that encircles the eye. It encircles the eye. And when it encircles the eye, you can see its job now is to drain. Its job is to drain secretions. Its job is to drain these secretions that are going to be produced now by the ciliary body. Now if this canal gets blocked, if this canal gets blocked, what happens now? The pressure inside the eye can increase. The pressure in the eye can increase, causing glaucoma in the patient. Causing glaucoma in the patient. Increasing the pressure. So the canal of Schlem or the scleral venous sinus. An important structure there. Next thing we have our lens. We have our lens. Now when we talk lens, when we talk lens, lens is a biconvex structure. It is a biconvex structure. So when we say it's biconvex, both sides are convex. It's transparent, it is flexible, and like I've mentioned to you before, it will change shape. It changes shape to allow precise focusing of light on the retina. It will change shape to allow precise focusing of light on the retina. This lens is going to be enclosed. It's going to be enclosed in a thin elastic capsule. It is enclosed in a thin elastic capsule and the lens is held in place just posterior to the iris. We said it's going to be held in place just posterior to the iris by the ciliary zonules, by those suspensory ligaments. The lens is avascular. The lens has two regions to it. It's got uh, basically one part that's the lens epithelium. The lens epithelium is going to be confined to the, 
to the anterior lens surface. It's confined to the anterior lens surface. And then the bulk of the lens you'll see is made up of lens fibers. Lens fibers. Now these fibers, they contain no nuclei and very few organelles. Also here, we're going to see the fibers are going to contain transparent, precisely folded proteins. Also found here are going to be precisely folded proteins called crystallins. Called crystallins. And here now we can appreciate the visual projection pathway that basically light is going to take to make its way to the cortex to stimulate that occipital cortex. Or our occipital lobe, uh, which contains the visual cortex. Here now you can see we've got the optic nerve from the right eye and we've got the optic nerve from the left eye. And here we can see we've got these fibers from this side making their way over and continuing on the same side, while some of those fibers cross over to the opposite side. And you see that exact same thing happening with the left eye fibers as well. So when they cross over, that creates that optic chiasma, as we've discussed before. The optic chiasma is the crossover point of the optic nerve, and you see now how that crossover point is formed. So those fibers that continue on this side, you can see they continue back up this way. And they're going to make their way up to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. Same thing is happening on the right side. Now these fibers coming from opposite sides, here you can see these fibers from the left eye coming and now they're making their way into, you can see, the pretectal nucleus and the superior colliculi. Same thing happening on this side. From there, then, this information is going to make its way all the way back to that visual cortex. And that's why, then, in physio, you guys are going to do a test where you're going to be able to uh, shine light into one eye, and you're going to see the same response in the other eye as well. So here you can see vision problems. So a normal emetropic eye, what happens in a normal emetropic eye? Light is going to focus right onto the retina, and there's no problems. But now here, when we talk hyperopic uh, eye or uh, uh, myopic eye, where you have hyperopia or myopia, those focal points aren't on the actual retina. You can see here in hyperopia, it's behind that retina. So we have to get convex lenses for the patients to help restore that focal plane back onto the retina. So here in a myopic eye, nearsightedness, the focal plane is in front of the retina. And we have to provide a concave lens, which will then provide that focal plane to be restored. So this will conclude the first part of this chapter.